Hello and welcome to Bun Med where we discuss concise medical knowledge that you can fit inside of a bun. In this video we're going to be having a look at a disease known as thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, specifically how it presents and as well as that um, how we might manage it. Thrombotic refers to, the, refers to its tendency to form lots and lots of clots all over the body. Thrombocytopenic refers to the fact that we are actually deficient in platelets when this process is occurring. And purpura refers to the characteristic rash that you may see along with it. Now, how does this link at all to primary hemostasis or even von Willebrand's disease? Well, remember I told you to uh, think about that enzyme, just keep it at the back of your mind, ADAMS13. So let's just see again how ADAMS13 comes into it. So firstly, remember in the normal process, we get the production of the volatile von Willebrand factor from our endothelial cells and megakaryocytes, which must be curved and cleaved by ADAMS13 into the usable form that's not as volatile. In thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, we have a deficiency or defect in our ADAMS13. And because we can't cleave our volatile von Willebrand factor anymore, this tends to build up in the blood. And once it builds up in the blood, this volatile von Willebrand factor actually can grab all of the nearby platelets, forming this initial platelet clot. Now, once the platelet clot has been made, it will actually also um, activate the clotting cascade, and this will lead to the formation of a fibrin sheath on top of the clots that are forming. Now, we know that this fibrin uh, sheath is actually very sticky. However, another thing that this fibrin sheath can be, especially when we get lots and lots of formation of these mini clots all over our body, is that it can be quite sharp. So that means when red cells are passing past the fibrin sheath, they actually get cleaved in half and split in half. Now, these sheaths, actually these sheaths and clots uh, tend to get deposited in small blood vessels. And because the red cells are being broken down, we can see there's a degree of hemolysis going on. So therefore, we can call thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura as a type of microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. Microangiopathic refers to the fact that it affects the small blood vessels. Hemolytic refers to the fact that we're splitting up the red blood cells. And anemia uh, refers to the fact that we don't have any more uh, blood, uh, red cells in our blood, or we have reduced blood, uh, red cells in our blood. Now, because we are clotting so much, we're actually tending to use up quite a lot of our platelets in these uh, clots that we form. So therefore, we tend to see a thrombocytopenia. These clots can then go get deposited all over the body, and one of the sites that they get deposited in is the kidneys, and this can lead to kidney damage and acute kidney injury. Another area with very, very small blood vessels tend to be the brain, so therefore, if it gets deposited in the brain, we may have neurological functions, uh, dysfunctions. Thus, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura actually presents in a characteristic pentad of symptoms. The first of these is a fever, and this is due to the neurological dysfunction that occurs and the changes going on in the brain. The second that thing that occurs is an anemia, and remember this is a type of hemolytic anemia, so our patient might actually be yellow or jaundiced. The third thing that happens is a thrombocytopenia, because we're using up our platelets, so therefore again we might see issue um, symptoms that they're not clotting properly, things like bruising, bleeding, and things like nosebleeds. We might then see neurological dysfunction, so this could be in the form of seizures, in drowsiness, coma, focal weakness, which means one side of the body is affected, just like the picture of that of a stroke. And lastly, we're going to see issues with renal failure, and this could be things like um, blood in the urine or even a reduced urine output. Okay, so what kind of investigations are we going to want to do? The first thing we do is a full blood count, and we're going to see a normocytic anemia because, look, we don't have an issue with the formation of the blood cells, and we don't have an issue um, with the composition of the blood cells. It's more that they're being split because of these sharp fibrin sheaths. We're also going to see a thrombocytopenia. The next thing that we want to do is, because we have this a degree of potential hemolysis going on, is do a reticulocyte count. And remember, we said that in our anemia videos, if we have hemolysis going on, our reticulocyte is going to be raised because our body is trying to compensate. Another thing that we want to do, because now that we've seen we have a hemolysis going on, is a direct Coombs test. And a direct Coombs test helps us to uh, dis helps us to identify uh, and differentiate between an autoimmune 
a hemolytic anemia and a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. So a direct Coombs test is negative in thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura or TTP. The next thing we want to do is a blood film. And what are we looking for in a blood film? Well, on a blood film, we're actually going to see the remnants of these blood cells, something that we call schistocytes because they kind of look like helmets. We're also going to want to do a urinalysis. And in the urinalysis or the dipstick, we're going to see the presence of proteins in our urine. And we're also going to do a use and ease where our urea and creatinine are often ra uh, raised because we have significant kidney damage. And lastly, of course, we want to work out, is there something going wrong with the ADAMS-13 enzyme itself? So doing an ADAMS-13 activity, uh, activity assay will give us that information to find out if our ADAMS-13 is working properly or not. So in terms of management, the first thing is to remove a lot of these clots and a lot of these um, things that are building up in our blood from our blood. And we do this with a process known as plasmapheresis, where we can filter the plasma. The next thing that we can use is something like corticosteroids. Other things we can use, now remember we're actually breaking down lots and lots of our um, red cells, so it's, it's good to actually give our body back what we actually need to make those red cells. So we should uh, give folic acid supplementation whenever we're using up all of our red cells. And lastly, because we have lots and lots of these clots going all around our body, we want to really minimize the risk that they might get deposited in areas such as our heart or our brain and uh, reduce the risk of a stroke or an MI. So therefore, we can give aspirin. OK, I know the symptoms of TTP can be quite difficult to remember because there's quite a lot of things going on. Um, but a good acronym that I got taught by one of my friends was fat nurse. Um, so instead of nurse, you have NR because NR seems to be the most prominent in nurse. So fat stands for F for fever, A for anemia and T for thrombocytopenia, N for neurological dysfunction and R for renal failure. So I, I really like to use this one just to help me remember some of the uh, some of the effects and some of the symptoms of TTP. That concludes the video. Hope you guys found it useful. Please feel free to share and subscribe. And if you have any comments, leave them below and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. See you in the next one.